think that is um, it for public comment, and so we want to transition into the review of the action plans. But before we do so, just want to um, acknowledge that we have lost Gabe to Australia, um, and uh, we have a, a new representative at Spur, uh, Adi Nagraj. Uh, welcome, um, and I uh, look forward to uh, working with you. Um, Denise, are you up? Cool. Um, so we're moving now from the urgent personal issues that people are facing right now in this moment around being displaced from housing and having their lives disrupted to the more esoteric, theoretical housing policy discussion um, that is nevertheless pressing because, as, as folks pointed out, when, there's, when the, you play the game of musical chairs and there are too few chairs in the game for everybody in it, the people who have the least power and the least resources always get stuck without the chair. And that's what's happening in the Bay Area. We do not have enough homes for the people who need them and the people who are feeling this the most acutely are the ones who have the least resources, whether it's people with no incomes or middle incomes. And that's why housing production is a part of the 3P discussion. Um, but it, it, it does get theoretical and less human. So I, I, I wanna just make sure people understand that it's all part of the same package. Um, so today we're finishing up the action plans from the production committee. It's a little bit of a um, mulligan stew of ideas that came up at different points in time and were not brought forth to the technical committee yet. And, and I've tried to bring them together as best we can in, in a brief overview presentation where I wanna just get through all the ideas so you see the totality of the thinking, and then we'll go back through the individual action plans for detailed discussion, questions, and voting. And, and I'll ask for shout outs or you know, comments from folks who participated in these committees. So as you recall, in an early presentation, Scott Littlehale pointed out that the reason housing costs so much that people can't afford to live in it anymore were the same 50 years ago that they are today. Um, for starters, we have uh, building construction is incredibly expensive in part because of the rules around building construction that make it expensive and difficult to build housing. Um, we have a technology problem where there probably are cheaper, more cost-effective ways of building homes, but we're not utilizing that technology to its full capacity. And the people who build the homes we live in um, need to be skilled, adequately paid, and and numerous enough that we can actually build our way out of the crisis. Right now we have a massive labor shortage and if we don't have more people to build the homes, we're gonna be hard pressed to find more homes. So now I'm adding CASA to that basic framework that we talked about when we talked about costs. Today we're gonna to talk about, um, I think we want to try and have something like, I may have gotten the math wrong, 800,000 homes by 2040, 750,000 homes by 2040. Well, what do we have to do to get there? These are the last CASA action plans, entitlement reform, working on construction technology, and talking about apprentice utilization. So those are the three topics for today's production presentation. And everything old is new again. This is, it, you know, we've been having conversations about this in the housing policy world for 50 years. So what we're hoping is that CASA will actually begin to make progress in the Bay Area on these same production issues. Um, the convergence of thinking around housing production at the national level because the housing crisis is so acute throughout the US is remarkable. And, and if folks who work in Sacramento know that the American Planning Association does not tend to be the most pro-housing regulation reform participant in the Sacramento dialogue, this year, the National APA, the Association of Planners, the ones who do the permitting for housing in the US and the planning for it, have said that the problem we have got to get our arms around is that community opposition to housing and change block good policy and that planning can no longer be a tool for people who don't want to let anyone else into their community. And that's the national position of the American Planning Association. So the first thing we're gonna talk about this morning is how does, what laws in California block housing? What does entitlement reform mean? Um, California has particularly challenging entitlement issues in part because we have a particularly unique set of housing laws. And 
these laws empower people who oppose housing more than they do people who need housing. Um, by and large, the people who oppose it are wealthier and better connected, and the people who need it don't live there yet and don't get a vote because they, they don't have the opportunity to live in the community where they're opposing it. So there are four laws in California that create issues. The California Environmental Quality Act, which has done amazing things for green belts in environmental places, but has also now been weaponized and is used frequently to provoke delay in litigation on housing projects. And more importantly, and subtle and harder to see, because of CEQA, the state streamlining law, we have one in California, it's called the Permit Streamlining Act. It says from date of application completeness to action, you have a year to approve housing projects in California. So why is almost no housing project approved in a year? Because CEQA case law says that the Permit Streamlining Act doesn't start until the CEQA process has concluded. So effectively, there are no deadlines for local government action in California on housing or any other land use matters as an artifact of our layering of laws in case law. Uh, the discretionary review process is a result of kind of ballooned out of control in some jurisdictions where there may be two, three, four hearing bodies that hear housing approvals, design review, landmarks, zoning boards, planning commissions, city councils. Each one of those may have a de novo hearing. They may have multiple appeals. There are projects in the Bay Area consistent with Plan Bay Area in a plan that OBAG paid for that had 35 public hearings before they got approved. And then they were sued under CEQA, delayed nine months, and lost their financing. These stories are not uncommon. So when you look at why don't we have enough housing, you've got to look at the land use regime that housing's operating in. Um, thirdly, the rules change all the time. When you apply for a project, you underwrite it, you get your land tied up, you're ready to roll, you submit it. The rules under which you will be evaluated can change multiple times between the day you start processing your application and the day you finally get a permit. Fees can be changed. Rules can be changed. Typically, fees are added. Requirements are added. And those 11th hour demands make it harder to build the building that you thought you were going to build when you started the process and results in entitlements that are completed that sit on the shelf unused. Uh, if I'm sorry. If people have questions, let me know. All right, and I'll slow down. Coaching is good. I'm trying to cover a lot of material in no time, but yeah. Oh, well, don't don't slow me down too much, or I'll be here all day. Uh, it's all in the it's all in the write up. Um, and then finally, a number of jurisdictions, not all, but many jurisdictions, are reacting to changes in state housing law by trying to avoid them by trying to avoid the state housing law changes. So with, are there questions about this stuff? Particularly clarifying questions. This is a summary of probably 12 production questions. Yeah. So like well, uh, for folks who aren't production experts, clarifying questions I, like. I would just great. like to have you go back, because I've never heard this, and explain why the Permit Streamlining Act starts after the CEQA process okay. ends. So glad you asked. Most people don't get it. Because that's kind of shocking to me, so. Yeah, no, it's case law. So the CEQA statute has deadlines in it, you know, cer certain statutory deadlines. The Permit Streamlining Act also has statutory deadlines in it. CEQA case law, so a court decided that the Permit Streamlining Act deadlines don't start until after the CEQA process has been concluded. So effectively, the Permit Streamlining Act never starts because a project is typically approved at the conclusion of the CEQA process, which has its own deadlines, which are longer and less, uh, they're different, right? It's, it's not about, you, you take, so the Permit Streamlining Act that says you, you take an application, you have 30 days to complete or incomplete it, right? And there's timelines for decisions, timelines for actions. None of those timelines apply because of CEQA. So you take in an application under CEQA and you may decide you need six months to complete, complete an initial study and assign a staff person. That wouldn't be allowed in the Permit Streamlining Act, but because it's CEQA, you can take six months to assign a staff person, just as an example. Ken. Just to make it even clear, you said CEQA has deadlines, and I may be wrong. CEQA doesn't have deadlines. They have minimum amounts of time that you need Fair to enough. allow. There is nothing in state law that says a jurisdiction can't take nine years to do an EIR. Is that, am I right? Pretty much, yeah. So, so it, it, on the big projects, sure, maybe you want to take the time. 
but if your if your garden variety planning project is you know two and three and four unit projects or even twenty to fifty unit projects, you basically have no deadlines anymore. When I started my career, I was a current planning chief. I lost a lot of sleep under the Permit Streamlining Act. I would have panic attacks about, oh my God, if I don't do this by this date, I'm deemed approved, and then I'm fired. I worried about that. Planners don't have to worry about that anymore. There is no deemed approved anything in local government trans permitting transactions anymore, and it's poorly understood because current planners are so busy processing the permits they don't have time to go talk to Sacramento about CEQA reform. Um, but it is for, if you've actually worked a current planning office, you know what I'm talking about. Question. Denise, I have a question because, you know, of course, this is a ton of information and a lot to cover. Um, do you all have a sense of how much, assuming that we supported all of these, how much of the number of units we're trying to produce do you think these changes actually get us collectively? It's different by jurisdiction, right? I can just tell you if you don't do this, you won't get more housing. And it doesn't matter. Pick, it, pick your flavor. Homeless housing, affordable housing, market rate housing, missing middle housing. Nothing will go faster if you don't fix these problems. So we'll talk about the fixes in a minute. Let me just get through the problem description. So th this is, there are three, um, two entitlement reform action plans and, and a few others. I'm going to hit the highlights and then we'll come back to discuss them in more detail because I do want to get the whole picture laid out. Um, this first Entitlement reform is basically, I think of as a good government reform. It, it restore fair, predictable, time-bound processes to the current planning function in local government, which is where housing is approved or denied. Im Im impose fairness in discretionary review. Um, this will entail amendments to a number of existing state laws so that that fairness principle is reflected in each one of them. So it will require amendments to the Mitigation Fee Act about how fees are charged and when they're calculated, the Permit Streamlining Act to create clear deadlines, and CEQA. Um, and in this case, we're just proposing a CEQA reform for small projects where the impacts are less significant. Um, and, and, you know, we can talk about that piece of it. But um, so, so to go through these, the first idea is – for. Cate right now, single-family homes, as an example, are categorically exempt under CEQA. That means you don't, CEQA doesn't apply. So we're suggesting that that blanket categorical exemption apply to smaller infill projects of 20 units or less. A lot of that's the missing middle kind of products. We've been duplexes, triplexes, infill, small infill that has very few significant environmental impacts on its face and would kind of clean out the bowels of a current planning department by getting rid of a lot of the noise of the small stuff so people can focus on the bigger projects. Yeah. One thing that I learned that was helpful from a lot of the city folks that participated in it is, is just how important that is, that to, to restate what you just said, allowing those smaller projects to move forward would allow the planning staff more time to dedicate to the bigger ones. Um, which I think is useful. And so it just, that was an important... Like for example, people, yeah, people fight over single-family home additions and decks. They fight like dogs over a, a duplex or a rear yard house, even when it's zoning compliant. And then current planners have to go to 10, 15 meetings about those little projects instead of focusing on the big ones. I just want to emphasize this. I was just given a statistic by uh, someone in our planning department who I'm sure didn't expect me to repeat it to this group. Uh, <laughs> Out of about 60 people who, who process in our current planning section, um, about 50 of them are working on projects of, uh, that, are, that are 10 units or smaller, and about 10 of them are working on projects bigger than, than, than 10 or 20 units, even though those 10 people, th those big projects, are thousands and thousands and thousands of units. Yeah, that, that, that's the problem. And it's like that in every city. It's like that in every planning commission and zoning board, too. You know, the stuff you hear most of the time is the little stuff where the neighbors are fighting. And you're basically running a public mediation service paid for by the applicant. Um, the second one is to disallow residential zoning changes that are attempts to skirt state housing law. Um, if you have zoning today and it allows 30-foot height limits or 50-foot height limits, 
tomorrow, downzoning those to avoid SB 35 or to avoid the Housing Accountability Act shouldn't be allowed in the Bay Area during a housing emergency. Um, so that kind of basic, no cheating. Um, another phenomenon that happens is oftentimes in the housing element, housing will be identified, a site will be identified in the housing element or the general plan for affordable housing. And then the city will take in an application and say, oh, well, actually, that site has to be rezoned to be consistent with the general plan, which takes it out of the protection of state housing law. So there are many sites in the Bay Area that are in the housing element being counted towards all sorts of regional planning uh, goals that when the application comes in is declared a rezoning, not eligible for protection under the Housing Accountability Act, not eligible for SB 35 streamlining, and can be put on the ballot, just to add to the fun. So it, really, if that's your housing site, you put it in your housing element. When an application comes in, it deserves protection by state law as to the density of the project when it comes in and is proposed, even if there is a project by project rezoning that occurs. Third, um, for, I'm sorry, fourth, where, where, where the zoning is there and the project is consistent with the zoning in the general plan, when you complete that project, the fees and the rules under which the project will be processed should be locked in place. So that 11th hour negotiations over housing impact fees for an affordable housing project, for example. There are senior housing projects paying housing impact fees that get doubled or tripled at the end of the day. There are affordable housing projects who pay two times the school impact fee because that's just the way you gotta play if you build a house in fill in the blank city. There are many market rate housing projects that get hung up in negotiations at the 11th hour. And what that does is it slows the volume of, of buildings that get approved. Often, if it's an affordable project, they can't raise the extra $30,000 a door so they lose their financing or the project becomes more vulnerable. It, it leads to a gamesmanship around housing where people show up and oppose on a case-by-case -case basis nearly everything and make the projects impossible to underwrite, which means they get approved and don't move forward. So that practice has to stop. And we've talked in the production committee about having some cap on that, some unit cap, so that it's, it's not, you know, 500 unit projects where maybe there's bigger issues at play or there, you know, so there may be some additional layering um, on that one, but, but that's the general principle. Did, did I catch that? Yes. Okay. Um, there should only be three de novo public hearings on a housing project period. You can have your zoning board, your design review board, and your city council each have a de novo hearing, and yeah, there might be appeals, continuances, but, but no more than three. What's a de novo hearing? New hearing. So project comes in, scheduled for hearing at the Oakland Planning Commission. It only gets, only, they only get one hearing on it. If they continue it, that's okay, but they don't get to decide to send it away for mediation and then bring it back again six months later or send it to the Landmark Commission and the Design Review Board and the Parking Committee and then bring it back. That, the hearing is the hearing, get the information, make the decision, and then move it along in the process. And there were current planning chiefs in the production committee who were like, yeah, that's a great idea. I don't know why we didn't do that before. Um, require approval of residential projects, small ones, 20 units or 20,000 square feet, in a shorter time period than the Permit Streamlining Act currently says. Right now it says approve them in 12 months. The plan, one of the planning directors on the committee is like, 12 months, 20 units, we can do that in six months. I'm like, okay, six months, six months it is. Um, and then annually report to the Barrier Metro HCD how many applications, how long it took to process them, how many hearings were held on each application, how many appeals, so that people get a sense of whether or not localities are doing their best to trim their sales and fly faster, straighter in the housing approval game and not abusing the process to slow up everything. And just to give you a real life example, you know I'm on the Berkeley Zoning Board. Last week we had a 33 unit, 100% affordable senior housing project on free land getting a density bonus for height that my fellow commissioners wanted to send to the design review board and to mediation because a neighbor showed up and said it would block their view. And we have the power to do that. Some of us objected and said, no, we need to act now. 
but but that happens and then that project could have been delayed a year and lost its funding it's you know it's a tax credit project it can only do so much that happens all the time even on the projects we think we care the most about um okay next one all right questions okay questions seeing none we'll keep moving we'll, we'll come back to discuss it we'll come back to discuss i just want to lay it all out matt uh, coming back to discussion is is fine if you want to go through the yeah, other Yeah, I just want to go through the whole thing because there's a lot here and we'll take all the time we have. And I'll pull this slide back up for, I know. Um, so the next idea in this is once you clean up typical local government practice on most projects, there are going to be bigger projects that also could be eligible for state streamlining. Right now we have a streamlining law called SB 35 was heavily negotiated in Sacramento. It had the support of labor and housing advocates. So the thought, but it, it's not being used a year after its adoption by very many projects. Two in the state of California. Both of them had heavy cross subsidy from commercial land uses. That's why they worked in SB 35. So the notion with this action plan is to make the SB 35 room bigger. So more projects are eligible to apply for SB 35 streamlining with the full array of both streamlining incentives as well as skilled and trained labor used in housing because this could be a mechanism to scale up the hiring of skilled and trained labor that's paid a prevailing wage to do housing by making this the most attractive mechanism for securing a streamlined approval for a bigger project. Again, this only applies for zoning compliant projects because that's where SB 35 applies and it has a lot of other limits on it. Um, but the way to make it work is you need to add money into this room to make it work. What? Ken. I, it might be helpful just very quickly to describe what SB 35 said and why it's not being used except by two projects. Okay, sure. SB 35 said that an, a project that's zoning compliant so it meets all the rules and standards of the locality that has on-site affordability, that meets a definition of infill, and that uses apprentice labor and pays a prevailing wage. There's a long laundry list, but those are the highlights. Can apply, can skip discretionary review, skip CEQA, and apply for a building permit. So do not, you know, circulate the board, go straight to the end game, which is a building permit. There are, there's some critique of SB 35. One of them is, what about design review? Isn't there some rule for some amount of design review? There have been some litigation around SB 35. That, so there may need to be some cleanup to the room just to get it to work better to deal with some of those issues. But for the moment, it's the best thing we've got in California. And, and, and there's a political willingness to use that mechanism. The reason it doesn't work is that on-site affordability can be prohibitively expensive for a market rate builder, and a full labor package can be prohibitively expensive for an affordable builder. So for example, at our senior housing project hearing, someone leaned over and said, why didn't they SB 35 this? I'm like, well, because they can't afford to use union labor. They're building it, it's a church, they're building it with whatever, volunteers, I don't know what they're doing, but it's not gonna work in SB 35. So, um, so you've, got, you've got two things that add cost to this room, the labor package and the affordability requirements, and developments mostly can't afford to pay for both without some offsets. So remember we had the whole conversation about offsets when we discussed inclusionary? If you require on-site affordability, even if that's all you require, you have to have economic offsets to pay for the added affordable or people won't be able to build it. Well, it's the same problem in SB 35. They're requiring very high levels of affordability in some places, up to 50% affordable units with no offset. So it makes the tool virtually unusable except in a unicorn situation, you know, a mythical beast that exists rarely and mostly in mythology. There were two examples of unicorns, so they do sometimes appear, but both of those were heavily commercial projects, and that's what the commercial land use paid for the affordable housing and the labor package. So if we want to use more apprentice-trained labor and pay prevailing wages, more projects need to have, be able to do that, and this is a place that gives them access to a pre-negotiated 
system for getting to that streamlined approval and paying for the union wages, but more money has to be available for more projects to work in it. So the more money part, in New York City, for example, negotiated over some period of time to have on-site affordability with a labor package, um, and they got 15 years of tax abatement. And, and so perhaps California should look for other models in the U.S. when we're trying to pair good wages and apprentice-trained labor with affordability that it, the market struggles to provide. So that's an example. And just for you know, quick thinking, it's like reverse redevelopment. Instead of giving the increment to the agency to give it back to the developer, the developer just keeps it for 15 years and then gives 100% of it back to the local agency. Um, the next is that uh, it, these projects should be eligible for the state density bonus without a double dip on the affordability. It can't, they can't be additive. If you're doing on-site affordable, that should count. So they get the 35% density bonus. Um, the, Today, in communities where they have performed their market rate RENA, but not their below market rate RENA, in order to use SB 35, they have to provide, I'm seeing eyes glaze over, sorry for the detail, it's very wonky. They have to provide half the units as affordable, which is great if all you want to do is accelerate affordable housing, but it doesn't work if you want to also accelerate mixed income projects. So that rate will have to be thought about and perhaps lowered. We don't have a lowered level to propose. Um, there's some loopholes, allow small projects, four units or less, to use SB 35 as streamlining just to get out of the discretionary review loop without added affordability or labor requirements. Um, and then have a time limit. You don't know, get, get an SB 35 project approved and then sit on it for 20 years. Like so use a use it or lose it approval. Um, there are still some things being discussed about these details with folks on the production committee, but this is sort of the basic framework, and I just want to see, Andreas or Scott, if you guys wanted to add anything to that overview. Just uh, the one bit of framing when you talk about you know, needing to add more money on the other side of the equation, or alternatively, combine it with policies that are reducing other uh, non-hard costs or some of the hard costs also besides uh, sure. labor. Yeah, it has to... Balanced sheet has to balance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I add something? Then? Yeah. Just, just to name some of the discussions. One is on the 15-year tax abatement. There was a discussion about the cost and the needing a fiscal analysis of that to make sure both that we're not giving away more than than actually is needed, but also because that is property tax that goes to services for the housing post right. Like, what's the fiscal impact to cities? Um, and the replacement, particularly if it's combined with other impact fee caps. Um, yeah. Good. And we'll come to fiscal at the end of this, I promise. Um, another, another way to lower cost is use technology. So uh, Adi built a lot of modular housing when he was with Bridge, and there were comments made by some of the folks who were here today about needing more modular for, for example, like tiny homes. Um, there's not much cost it can do to accelerate modular, but MTCA bag can create an ongoing working group about modular that could include tiny homes and, and other installations to lower costs. So I was just going to ask Audi if he wanted to add anything quickly. Yeah, the only things I would add are um, I think there has to be a lot of education with building officials. Um, the work in the modular factories are regulated by a state HCD. The work on site is regulated by cities, and I think there needs to be a lot of clarity around that. Structural tie-ins, Title 24, that's all regulated by cities. So there's some murky areas where the city's jurisdiction and the state's jurisdiction overlap, and I think there needs to be a lot of education there. And then certainly, this is more of a market force, but we certainly need more modular manufacturers. Um, the insurance market, the financing market is a bit stymied right now because there are so few. So I think we all would benefit, general contractors would benefit if there were more. Um, and then part of the conversation in that group would be creating a robust pipeline for the factories that are being created. There are two union factories now in California, but they're, they're subject to cycle risk like all housing. So is there a way of finding other product types that they could sell into like ADUs or tiny homes or something to keep the product cycle moving? So those are all issues that that working group would talk about. And then there are two labor force action plans that, that Scott prepared, um, I'm just to hit the highlight. One is when there is streamlining or public money, 
apprentice labor should be utilized. And the second is that there needs to be a plan for training more people to do construction work. There was a massive labor shortage. So Scott, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I mean, I, the, um, the issue of career technical education is one that's not squarely in my wheelhouse uh, as far as the community college system goes. And um, you know, I look forward to what I think we lack is, is expertise in that area. What I do know is, is that the community college system has other industries in a higher priority position than the, than the construction related you know, occupations and industry. And uh, we can move forward on that. What we do lack is something like uh, the sort of analysis that I've seen done in Washington state, where very careful uh, matching of workforce development programs was done uh, by, by some outstanding academic trained um, economists. And they found quite simply that apprenticeship uh, delivered bigger returns uh, to workers and to governments in terms of tax revenue for lower cost, much higher ROI than any other kind of workforce de uh, development initiative out there. I don't know if we need to replicate that kind of analysis for California or trust that they did it right in Washington state. Great, thank you. Um, and then the last action plan um, for the production committee, which is, is over after these, this um, happens. And really, this isn't something we're going to vote on today. I just wanted to present the ideas to people so we know they're coming because we are creating fiscal problems with some of our production action plans that we, we want to be mindful to solve. And the notion is all this stuff we just talked about will be useless if 20 years from now cities still have no fiscal incentive to build housing and they're in fact punished for doing so because they, they have costs from housing that they are not reimbursed for or rewarded for undertaking. So um, production policies have got to include a fiscal action plan that is a pro-housing fiscal action plan. The policy we have now of charging the last guy in the door to pay for everything we need in local government, infrastructure, housing, green building, you, know, you name it, and it's layered onto housing, that's killing housing production. And it's hurting market rate and affordable housing equally. So we got to curtail that. That means we have to replace the money with some money from somewhere else. Um, and we need a massive amount of subsidy dollars for new affordable housing projects. So. I'm not gonna go into this in detail now, but essentially the recommendation is that MTC and consulting help put together a pro-housing fiscal policy that includes rewarding cities that build housing, consequences for cities that don't, and a lot of new money for housing subsidy. And that will come back from MTC in September. So, so that's the totality of the remaining action plans.